If virals from dying light trapped you inside your urban apartment building alone, what would you do? Zombies are supposed to be mindless killing machines. They can't think, can't strategize, and can't lure you out of your safe house to eat you alive. Unfortunately for Aiden, who's trapped, lonely, and terrified of going outside to hunt for supplies, the zombies lurking in his apartment can think, they can strategize, and they absolutely will try to lure you outside or crawl up the balconies to get you. Let's see if we can outsmart them. I'm going to break down the mistakes made by our lonely survivor. See if we can make better decisions and ultimately attempt to beat the smart zombies in alone. Bearded Aiden tells us it's day 42 of a zombie outbreak and lets us know how things are going by tying a noose around his neck. He cut back 42 days to meet pre Zed Aiden, a loft dwelling trust fund baby who hangs surfboards on his walls and wakes up with a new girl every morning. His latest one night stand doesn't seem thrilled to see him and bolts before he's even woken up. By the time he gets downstairs, he slept through the apocalypse. Sounds of screaming and sirens only seem to register when he turns on his TV and sees an emergency warning system by the Office of Civil Defense. From his balcony, he gets a front seat view to the end of the world. Across the way, a neighbor slams through his glass patio door. Overhead, a fiery helicopter crashes into a nearby building. Down below in the courtyard, a torrent of people flood out of a building, passing a young girl calling out for help. Aiden yells that he's coming to help her, but she lunges for an old lady who got there first. She and another infected tear the old lady to shreds. Aiden might have been asleep when the world ended, but he should be wide awake now. The vague emergency broadcast warning coupled with screaming and sounds of explosions outside means the threat is not only real, but very close to us. Witnessing an attack just a few feet below us should confirm our suspicions. Our options here are to stay or to flee. Leaving the city is a solid strategy for any crisis, but it's going to be pretty tough to do in a place like Los Angeles. LA extends for 44 miles from north to south and for 20 nine miles from east to west. And that's just the actual city of Los Angeles. The megacity of greater Los Angeles covers an area of 2,281 square miles. On an uncrowded day, it can take an hour to reach the Los Angeles city limits. The problem here is that the city is a maze, and it's not even the first maze we'll have to traverse to get out of here. Our apartment complex is a maze too, full of people running for their lives as well as zombies, of which we can't discern between, all blocking our way to the stairs down to the the parking garage to our car. Even if we can reach the car, do we have enough gas to make it through the traffic jams blocking the roads? Do we have a map or a fallback location? To even attempt an evacuation, we should have a bug out bag ready to go, stocked with a 9mm Glock, one of the most common and reliable handguns in the United States, as well as ammo, water, first aid kit, paper map, flashlights, and a few MREs or replacement bars. Even then, we should still grab a second and third weapon that don't require ammo, in case we're forced to abandon our car on the road and seek shelter elsewhere. With everyone fleeing the city like rats on a sinking ship, staying put in our apartment and waiting it out is likely the safest choice for most of us. We're not Jason Bourne, so transforming our apartment into our safe house is priority number one. Aiden tumbles back inside his apartment, his front door opens, and his neighbor Brandon suddenly rushes in. He tells Aiden something's happening, that his roommate attacked him. He seems to have a cut on the back of his neck and rushes to the bathroom moaning. Aiden grabs a kitchen knife. The TV emergency warning stops as the reporter appears and says the infected are dangerous, screaming, bleeding from the eyes, and biting and scratching people. The virus seems to be passing through the blood. Halfway through telling Aiden he isn't infected, Brandon's eyes suddenly begin to bleed and boils appear on his face. Aiden tells him to leave, and Brayden has just enough mental clarity to get out the front door before he turns into a zombie and kills Aiden. Brandon's immediately swarmed. Aiden barely gets the door locked and watches through the people as zombies tear into him. Aiden is insanely lucky that Brandon hadn't fully turned before entering his apartment. He's also lucky Brandon was coherent enough and willing to leave. Like I told you in The Night Eats the World, your door closing game needs to be super tight. And in the real world, Aiden would not get any more second chances after leaving the door unlocked like this. Your first step is to secure your door by locking it, then barricading it. A fridge is okay, but you're sacrificing your perishable food for an ineffective obstacle. This door opens inward, so 
a dining chair firmly wedged under the handle and against the floor, or under the handle and against the wall so that the wall or floor can act as a secondary brace should be the first strategy. Then heavier objects can be used to reinforce it. The other option is to use something wider than the door as a drop bar across the door. A piece of wood from a bookshelf or his metal curtain rod from the shower would work. Yes, drilling and banging makeshift brackets into the walls to either side of the door would be noisy, but only for a moment, and zombies would eventually get distracted by something else, especially in these first chaotic moments of the apocalypse. Once the door is secured, Aiden should go into the bathroom and kitchen and fill the tub, sinks, and any other containers he has with water. We learn later he has tons of water bottles. That's great. Rely on the tap first and keep the bottles on reserve in case the utility shut off. Then, put buckets out on the balcony to catch rainwater. If you don't have a reserve of Evian in your apartment, the next best option is to create a solar still, like I showed you in Sweetheart. You can also siphon water from the toilet tank as well as your apartment water heater. After the water, Aiden needs to plug in all of his valuable electronics and charge them fully, keeping them charged until the electricity shuts off, at which point he should turn off his electronics to save for emergencies, like we also talked about in The Night Eats the World. He can use his phone to call family as well as emergency numbers like 911 or even the CDC. This epidemic seems to have started overnight and nearby, but probably busy. But that's not really the point. The point is to use tools at your disposal while they're still available to gather information you might need. I would also argue that if Aiden has a printer, he should get on his computer and begin printing off important information, like a local area street map in case we need to forage for supplies later, or instructions for how to build the solar still, or how to urban hunt for birds. Aiden should also take quick stock of his fridge and pantry to know what he has and what he doesn't. Hell, if he has things like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, or potatoes, he could go online and print out quick patio growing guides just in case things get that dire. Sure, supply runs will eventually be a necessity, but having the information on hand to start a food garden can't hurt. Aiden could also grab a piece of paper and write survivor inside on it, then slide that under the front door, so anyone still alive moving through the building would know that he was there. He could even include a code phrase the zombies wouldn't be able to say, like, the Mississippi might melt, so he knows to open the door if he hears it. Traumatized that his first world problems and become World War Z problems, Aiden starts drinking and tries drunk dialing people. No one picks up. He realizes he has unread texts from his parents, saying they're coming to get him and his sister. By day six, the news is still operating, keeping people updated and warning them to ration food and water. Aiden moves to the bed downstairs and barricades the front door with his refrigerator, then records a video log while listening to other survivors getting chased by zombies through the halls outside. By day 19, the news tells Aiden that the zombie's reptilian brain is forcing them to attack the uninfected. She says they're still aware of their actions, but can't help it. On another video log, Aiden worries about having to go out for supplies. Water has stopped running, but electricity still works. Unlike Sam in The Night Eats the World, Aiden is an extrovert and ill-prepared to entertain himself alone in his apartment. I can hear every introvert viewer laughing now. 19 days of isolation or nothing. They're rookie numbers, and he's gonna have to pump those up. Also, at this point, the phones are still working. He might not be able to reach his family, but he should still be able to call literally anybody else. Time to reconnect with those Facebook friends you've been avoiding. After, he should be worried about what this CDC doctor on TV is telling him. These aren't normal zombies. This zombie fire is puppeting people, like they're trapped inside a Pacific Rim Jaeger with the kill switch permanently turned on. They can see what they're doing and begging themselves not to hurt anyone, but they can't stop themselves. That jacks the danger level up considerably. Do we have to incorporate it into our survival strategies better than Aiden does? We need to start testing the zombies' limitations, to prep for supply runs, and eventually clearing the building. This might mean that they can problem solve around traps we set, or it might even mean that they can be reasoned with or mimicked in a useful way. As an side, don't break your mirrors. They can be used to signal others at far distances and to peer around corners, which will become very useful when we have to start supply runs. We can also use that light trick from the mummy to light our apartment when the electricity stops working. A sound coming from the bathroom surprises Aiden. A zombie emerges and Aiden hides behind a surfboard. It's his girlfriend, or was. When her back is turned, he stalks closer with his bat and KOs her before she can attack him. Aiden drops her body off his balcony and goes into the bathroom. He discovers she crawled into his apartment through the ventilation system and barricades the hatch with his surfboard. 
This should have him reaching for his brown pants. Think about it. She remembered his apartment, found a vent, crawled inside, and followed his sounds until she fell back into his apartment. Or she crawled into the vents as a human, turned, and then crawled around until she heard him and dropped in to say hello. So she might have formed a plan of attack while zombified. That's some seven days to die horde night stuff. Hiding to get the jump on her was a great idea, but he should have double tapped her the second she hit the floor, then retrieved a kitchen knife and put it through her eye just to be safe. Using the surfboard to block the vent is a good idea in a pinch, but he should replace it with a metal shower rod. The edges are sharper and less likely to slip out of place like the surfboard is. Even better if we have wood and nails to board up the opening, but that would prevent us from using the vents later on if we needed to. On day 41, Aiden tells us he's losing his mind. He knows he's too cowardly to open his own front door, so starvation is inevitable. He hears a beep from his phone and listens to a voicemail from his parents. His mom tells him that his sister got out of town before things imploded and went to their cabin, but his parents got trapped at their office. Aiden listens as a zombie breaks into the room that they're in. Distraught, Aiden grabs his bat and steps out into the hall. He finds Brandon crawling around with bites all over his body and is suddenly swarmed by zombies. He bolts down the hall, dodging zombies like an NFL scout is in the audience. He misses his own apartment door and bounds into the stairwell to the next floor down. He dodges and weaves until he reaches another set of stairs and barely makes it back into his own apartment. Two zombies know he's in there, and one barks at him to come here while trying to bang the door down. Finally, electricity across the city gives out. With supplies dwindling and emotions raging, Aiden needs to calm himself and strategize before he gets himself killed. That's all this excursion into the hall is good for. It's just a good way to die. Aiden doesn't need to go out into the halls at all, at least not yet. Instead, he should use the balconies on the outside of the building to move from apartment to apartment. This would let him clear one apartment at a time. The safest way to do this would be to use a spoon against the railing of each balcony, luring the zombies out so they either dive over the balcony in search of the noise, or so he can bludge them with a bat or stab them with his knife. He could also avoid the apartments that have zombies in them altogether. Many apartment buildings in the United States are required to have self-closing doors on each floor so that they can close in the event of a fire and potentially contain it to a single apartment or building level. This means that Aiden could try to clear the hallway on the top floor of his building before venturing out. Then he could shut the doors to this level and clear the other apartments one by one using our old hole in the door, stab the zombies that come to the whole trick. To clear the hallway, it's time to start experimenting. Personally, I would create a sound trap and toss it down into the courtyard away from the building. This would hopefully compel the zombies in the upper floors to throw themselves out of the windows and off the balconies in search of that noise. To create the sound trap, you could either use an iPod, voice recorder, or your phone to record a message in your own voice. Then tape it to the couch cushion, soften its fall. Ideally, once the message ended, the zombies would get distracted and forget to return to the building altogether. We've returned to the open. It's day 42. Aiden prepares to end it all when he notices a girl still alive in another apartment across the courtyard in one floor below his. He falls off the chair, choking for a moment before the rope snaps and he crashes to the ground. In his last video blog, he tells us his battery is about to die and he's off to go find the girl he saw. He says he's almost sure that she's real. On day 43, Aiden steps out onto his balcony and gets spooked back inside by a Zed. The girl suddenly opens her curtains and spots him. Using paper signs, he tells her his name is Aiden. She she writes back that her name is Eva. They let each other know their situations. She has food but no water, and he gives her a partial lie. He says he has tons of bottled water, which appears to be true, although we never see it. But he lies and tells her he still has food. Zombies on her level force them to cut the conversation short, but they agree to chat tomorrow. On day 44, Aiden goes outside to chat with Eva. He asks what happened. She tells him the zombies were scratching on her walls. He asks her if she has a baseball glove, and she pulls out a lacrosse stick. Close enough. Aiden ties a baseball to a rope and sends it over to her, and she ties the rope to her balcony. Then, Aiden sends across four bottles of water on hangers. Suddenly, a business zombie sees Eva. He begins leaping up the building from balcony to balcony to reach her. Aiden throws something, pulling the Zed's attention away. The business zombie starts his climb to Aiden. Meanwhile, the zombie at his door begins banging harder. The business zombie reaches Aiden's balcony and bangs his head against Aiden's window until it shatters, knocking the zombie down. At which point, Aiden steps outside and beats him to death with his bat. 
The supply rope between their apartments is a solid way to get her water, but it only allows for moving supplies downhill to her apartment. Instead, I would have had Eva wrap the cord around the railing and then toss the ball back to me so I could create a rope circle pulley system and we could pass things back and forth rather than just one way. To prevent the wind or sudden imbalance from knocking supplies off course, I would have also bent the metal hook of the hangers in a tighter circle around the rope so it couldn't slide off. As for the parkouring zombie, instead of panicking, both of them should have weapons ready to stab him in the face or knock him off the building when he reaches their level. The fact that the zombie redirects to Aiden because Aiden is making more noise and Eva hides out of view shows that the zombie seems to have very instinctive toddler level sense of object permanence. Simply ducking out of sight when he reached the ground again may have confused him enough to back off. Aiden strategizes with himself. He wants to reach Eva, but every door is locked and then there are zombies everywhere. He realizes something and rushes out into the hall to find Brandon's corpse. He loots it for keys. Suddenly, a band of zombies wanders by. With nowhere to go, Aiden drops to the floor beside Brandon and pretends to be dead. The zombies stumble away just long enough to let Aiden reach Brandon's apartment and let himself inside. Inside Brandon's apartment, Aiden follows blood on the walls to a bedroom where he finds Brandon's roommate lying on the bed. He tosses a helmet at her to check if she's alive, but she doesn't stir. So he loots the kitchen for peanut butter and stale chips. Turns out, Aiden is the luckiest neighbor in the world. Brandon was a climber. There's ropes and carabiners everywhere, and under the bed he finds an ice climbing pick. Suddenly, Brandon's other roommate charges out of the darkness. Aiden gets knocked against the wall and kicks the zombie back before narrowly grabbing the pickaxe. The roommate attempts to bite down, but Aiden spikes him in the back, killing him. And from the bed, he hears Brandon's female roommate begging for him to help her, so he mercy kills her too. Instead of attempting another run on the hallway he knows is full of Zeds, Maiden should have considered going over the balcony first. Brandon told him there was at least one zombie in his apartment, and a one-on-one -on -one fight on the balcony is going to be much more doable than rushing through the hallway horde to fight in a tiny dark bedroom like this. Playing dead was a panic move, and he's lucky it worked. But I would not want to depend on it, unless I was desperate, as it's difficult to fight or flee from this prone position. Once inside Brandon's apartment, Aiden needs to remember the golden rule of zombie playthroughs. Every room contains a zombie until we know it doesn't. He should move through this apartment, clearing it room by room, before looking for anything else. To clear it, he should have brought a large fragment from the mirror he broke, tied it to a bent piece of metal or ladle so he could look around corners before entering rooms. He could even close all the doors he comes to, then clear the main open area first before returning to clear each room individually. The point is to simply work smarter, not harder, and Jason born your way to survival, using everything at your disposal and when Aiden finds the unresponsive body on the bed, it should go without saying that he should double tap her with a stab to the head immediately just to make sure. Aiden rushes to the door, then into the hall. The zombies have gathered nearby in the darkness. He silently closes the door, only to find the zombie plaguing his door still there. He barely sneaks back into his apartment undetected. He then inventories Brandon's climbing bag and finds two walkie-talkies that still have battery, but wonders how he's going to get one to Eva. Aiden straps on his backpack and bat and ties pieces of fat into a long prisoner's rope, which he tosses off the balcony. He climbs down to the courtyard, narrowly dodging a horde of Zeds as they chase sounds around the building. He tosses a bundle containing one walkie-talkie up to her balcony, then darts back across and hides in his first floor balcony just long enough for the zombies to dart away again before climbing back up. This is pure movie nonsense. The entire point of connecting their apartments via the supply rope was to pass things like this between each other safely. Even if he was worried about the walkie-talkie breaking, the better option here would be to toss it to her so she could catch it like the baseball, or stuff it into a couch pillow and toss that across for extra cushion. He has the high ground and decent aim. There was no reason to risk the climb down. If Aiden wants to do all his thinking with his little brain, the better option would still have been to wait for Eva to wake up, tell her to make a bed sheet rope on her end, then send across supplies via the cord bridge, and then climb down to climb up the sheet rope to her apartment on the other side. But let's be honest, he's on the top floor of this building. The solution to all this is to simply build a ladder from his balcony to the roof and walk around to the balcony above hers before letting himself down one floor to join her in her apartment. It's day 45. Eva and Aiden distract each other for a while over the walkie-talkies with banter and flirting, but night descends soon enough. Aiden removes the surfboard 
blocking the ventilation system and crawls inside. He smells death and finds a dead zombified body down a side tunnel. He crawls to the next apartment and drops into the bathroom, noticing blood on the bathtub, but there's nothing inside. He plunges deeper into the apartment and searches each room as thoroughly as a babysitter that just wants to go watch TV. In the kitchen, he notices a fridge barricading the door and opens the cabinets to find them stockpiled with every preserved food known to man, including Twinkies. If only Tallahassee were here. Eva points that the fridge against the door means someone else is in the apartment with him. She tells him to run, but he won't without the food. Without it, they'll starve. Aiden notices a hole in the apartment wall and turns to find Edward standing in the kitchen with a MacGyvered spear made from a broom, two knives, a metal bar, and duct tape. Knowing now that Aiden's not a zombie, Edward lowers his spear, tells him it isn't his apartment, and encourages Aiden to take the booze left in the cabinet since he's old. When his back is turned, Edward knocks Aiden unconscious with his own bat. Aiden wakes, tied to a bed with Lucy the zombie reaching for him, begging him to kill her. Edward tells Aiden he's going to drug him and feed him to her to keep her alive. Eva calls for help, distracting Edward for a moment. When Edward returns, Aiden knocks him off balance and tosses him at Lucy, who rips out the back of his neck. Going through the vents would have allowed Aiden to avoid needing to use the hallways at all. To protect himself along the way, he should have worn leather or blue denim on his arms to protect against bites, and carried a kitchen knife to use on anything alive or undead up there. A knife would also have been small enough to keep on himself tucked away so that he couldn't become separated from his weapon like he ultimately does in the kitchen. Dropping down into the apartment would have made enough noise to draw attention from any Zeds that were in there. Before dropping down, he should have banged on the ceiling for a bit to draw any zombies to him, so he could use the vent opening as a murder hole and easily dispatch them. Even after doing that, he should move through, clearing rooms one by one like we talked about. Then he would have noticed this glaring hole in the wall in the back bedroom, and he might have taken more notice of the fridge blocking the front door. As for Edward, Aiden's not in the right frame of mind to imagine an old guy setting a trap like this one, but he should have had a second weapon on him just in case. Of course, Edward ambushes him with a headshot, so it's likely Edward would have taken his knife anyways. That's why you don't turn your back on strangers in the apocalypse. Once captured, Aiden really only has two options here. The first is to keep Edward monologuing enough to cut through his restraints under the bed. In a pinch, he could have kept Ed going by asking about his and Lucy's love story. Guy seemed talkative. The other option is going along with Edward, convincing him to give him the pills. Then Aiden could wait until he's within arm's reach to use his legs and knock Edward off balance to feed him to his wife. Aiden grabs his pack when even tells him via walkie-talkie that the zombies have broken into her apartment. He rushes out of Edward's apartment. His own apartment door is locked, forcing him back into Brandon's. He leaps the eight feet across to his own balcony, deploys his sheet rope, and slips down to the courtyard. A zombie comes for him. Aiden isn't able to get the bat out of his backpack. Luckily, there happens to be a loaded 12-gauge laying nearby. He kills two zombies with it, drawing the attention of the whole apartment complex. Zombies begin leaping from balconies after him. He rushes up Eva's side of the building. She lets down her own sheet rope, and Aiden climbs up. A zombie latches on and climbs up after him. He uses the pocket knife to cut the sheet and the zombie falls to its death. Once united, they run for the door, only for two zombies to come barreling inside. They rush out, narrowly reaching the stairs. They open the door and zombies pin Aiden to the wall. They manage to get one off of him, but another sends him tumbling down the stairs. As the zombie bites down on him, Eva ice picks the zombie in the back. The pair race through hallway after hallway, tossing zombies aside until they reach his apartment. Eva gets inside just as Aiden is tackled by the zombie stalking his apartment. The door closes on both men, and Eva's left to fear the worst. Suddenly, Aiden appears, but he won't let her come near her. He rushes to the balcony, prepared to throw himself off if he's infected, like Brad Pitt in World War Z. He tells her to crawl through the vents to the neighbor's apartment, where there's plenty of food to wait for the Zeds to expire. He strips away his clothing, and we see a bloody bite mark on his shirt. But when he finally tears off the last layer, there's no bite. As they hear the zombie pounding at the door, they both slam their bodies into the fridge to keep it in place, and we leave them to a doomed, all bed romantic unknown ending. Well, Aiden's plot armor is so thick, it's no wonder he never fashions any actual bite-resistant armor for himself. Unfortunately for Aiden and Eva, Aiden has the survival skills of a love-struck teenager being initiated into a death cult, and it's likely he's dead within a matter of weeks anyways. But with luck on his side, I give him a survivor score of 2.5 out of 5. Maybe with someone to live for, he'll finally start using his big head for a change. As for Eva, she's a total unknown. 
own. And I like to think, right after the movie ended, she shanked Aiden and took all his stuff. Without proof, though, I'm gonna give her a survivor score of 2 out of 5. There were several ways Aiden could have methodically cleared and secured the top floor of the building, making it easy to scavenge for supplies and eventually rescue Eva. He could have exclusively used the balconies to clear out apartments one by one, or he could have simply fashioned a ladder to the roof and united with her in about an hour. Despite reuniting, I think it's safe to say they Romeo and Julietted shortly after the ending when their food and water ran out, or the zombies eventually broke into their Alamo and ate them. All in all, I think the smart zombies from alone were unbeaten. Moral of the story, you have no chance if you live in a large city when the zombie apocalypse pops off. And don't miss my next video where we need to find a way to permanently put down two gigantic hard to kill hillbillies before they drag us back to their basement for dinner. Watch the video on the left to see why we wouldn't survive a full-blown zombie Armageddon.